Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to react to yet another video from Wisecrack. Uh, this one was, again, recommended uh, from a viewer, uh, somebody who was in the Discord server. If you're not in the Discord server, join on below so you can uh, help uh, help recommend these sorts of things to me and, you know, torture me with what is, in their words, oh god, oh god, the pain, the stupid it burns. So this... Um, at least if I'm to believe uh, to believe my uh, my Discord server, uh, this is a particularly bad one to react to. So uh, we're we're set to have a good time. Um, this is uh, this is as well from Wisecrack, which is a channel I've reacted to before. Um, I'll put links to in the description to some of the other uh, some of the other Wisecrack videos I've reacted to and, and analyzed. Uh, this one is titled "Is God Really Dead?" Uh, funny enough, I have reacted to their analysis of the movie "God's Not Dead" two. I think it was. I think it was two, um, and that was that was also that was also pretty bad. Um, I'm led to believe that this also does have a little bit more to do with uh, an actual careful analysis of Nietzsche, uh, which seems to be this guy's uh, academic specialization. So at least he's it, he should know something about what he's talking about. But we'll see. We'll see. Maybe it's a. Uh, Maybe it's going to be un intolerable and absolutely unbearable and uh, and uh, literally painful to get through. But um, maybe it'll be fun. If it won't be fun for me, at least it'll be fun for you. So without uh, too much further delay, uh, let's give it a go. All right. Let's start from the beginning, shall we? This video is brought to you by BetterHelp. Hey, heads up. God is dead. No, I'm not just quoting my favorite evangelical film. God is dead. I'm parodying one of our favorite non-evangelical philosophers, Friedrich Nietzsche, who dropped this legendary line in 1822, and in the process changed the course of contemporary philosophy. Okay, sort of. Um, so, he's... Okay. I'm just going to give some background here. I'm assuming that he's going to do something similar and that he's not going to be just completely absurd with what he has to say here. Um, but I figured I should I should give some background to this as well. Uh, at least it wouldn't hurt. So I'm not exactly sure why he says this changed the course of Western philosophy. Um, I mean, if you want to say that Nietzsche was something like uh, that, he I don't know marked the transition from I don't know modernism to postmodernism, maybe. But even that, not really. Uh, he introduced the idea of nihilism, but, but that really didn't get picked up until the, the absurdists, the, the Albert Camus and whatnot of the 20th century, 50 odd years later. I, I mean, and also, if you, I mean, if you're going to say that he was the first very serious atheist, that's certainly just not the case either. Um, Nietzsche was just one more step in a very long line of philosophers, uh, going back to, uh, certainly to the Enlightenment. So if you go back to, uh, to... Certainly, your your David Hume's. Uh, if you go even further back to your Hobbes, your Rousseau's, your uh, your even even the various sort of skeptics, uh, the sort of Peronian skeptics, your Montaigne's, your it, even kind of Descartes, but not not exactly. Um, but if you go back to even the early, the early, the very early parts of the early modern period, <clears throat> there, there was a trajectory that led very clearly to. Uh, to Nietzsche and to Nietzsche's sort of death of God in the in the cultural um, the cultural mind, let's say, <clears throat> and it's not like Nietzsche represented some massive sea change. Yes, he was uh, he was a significant thinker. Right? He was part of a, a a very significant tradition, and he developed uh, developed a lot of ideas and a lot of novel ways. Uh, he was very steeped within various historical traditions as well. So, yeah, he was significant, but maybe we're overselling here because of the um because of the radical sounding uh proclamation that god is dead etc cetera, etc cetera. maybe i don't know we'll see what he has to say and see if he actually back, backs this claim up or if it's one of those uh one of those little introductory bits that winds up becoming completely irrelevant to everything said later on in, in the remainder of the essay um i have just been creating midterms over the last week or two and uh, i've been getting a lot of those it's funny why undergraduates need feel the need to make their uh, their particular little paper seem of world of world significance but um you'd think that a professional philosopher like this would know better but mm, well well let's see 
Anyway, continuing on. But much like Kevin Sorbo's Oscar unworthy performance, these three words have gone on to fuel all sorts of writers, artists, and intellectuals who had such a bummer time at church growing up that they spent their adult lives militantly fighting religion. So, I mean, at least, at least we're uh, we're willing to acknowledge that, and and the fucking nihilists uh, here uh, are uh, uh, kind of a, I don't know, a, a farcical example, right? A parody example uh, of the kind of uh, oh, excuse me, the uh, the sort of rejection of. Uh, meaning intrinsic to the world and therefore uh the 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 resting of control from the world and, and appointing it to oneself and, that, and that's essentially yeah, very very briefly uh Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's idea of will to power but i mean i i will say i'll give him credit to uh to uh to to at least properly describing the stereotype of the neckbearded atheist who's just mad at their dad for bringing him to church every Sunday morning. So there's at least that. I'll grant him that. That's good. Let's see. Let's see what we have to say about the, uh, the dude's nihilists here. Are today's atheists carrying the spirit of Nietzsche into the 21st century? And if old Friedrich were alive today, would he be making dank memes about how church is for normies? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint the edgelords out there, but we think that Nietzsche's God is dead is not just a critique of Christianity, but also a critique of atheism. So let's figure out what would happen if Nietzsche logged sort on of. to Reddit's atheist community in today's video on the death of God. Did we miss the point? Okay guys, before we keep going, I wanna take a second and thank this video sponsor. All right, I'm not sponsored by uh, BetterHelp or whatever, so let's just go to the most replayed section, which is almost certainly where uh, the video actually continues. All right, here we go. That's a nice trick, by the way, if you're not aware of it. Anyway, um, on that, on the last point that he was making, uh, his sort of introductory bit here, uh, I think that that's that's actually probably probably about right. Um, Nietzsche, Nietzsche just as just as vehemently criticized a um, a uh, extreme rationalism, which was very common at the time when he was writing. Uh, it, and and even in the centuries leading up to it, so it was very critical of uh, of our attempts to rationalize and to, to fully grasp and understand uh, the natural world in the way that modern sort of new atheists, the sort of early two thousands new atheists, would have uh, the, the the you know Dawkins, Hitchens, Dennett, those sorts, uh, in the way that they would have they would have had us do, sort of replacing religion with science, right? Uh, yeah, Nietzsche would have absolutely criticized that sort of thing. He did, did in fact, criticize that sort of thing because that kind of rationalism was was around. It was uh, um, not, not ne obviously not nearly as common and not nearly as uh, vicious and not nearly as, uh, quite frankly, uh, not nearly as uneducated, but uh, but or at least philosophically uneducated, but uh, but it was certainly around. But, all right, let's, uh, let's get into the meat of it. Let's get into the meat of it. So far, it's not horrible. I'm pleased. It's Greg. Now, let's get back to the show. Okay, so if you saw our recent video on nihilism, you maybe heard me use a term that I stole from one of my old professors. And okay, so two things. One, clean your shirt. Just because you're a philosopher doesn't mean you have to dress like that. Two, uh, maybe I should. Um, comment below if you'd like to see me approach uh, that, uh, that video as well. Uh, especially if he's talking about angry 17-year-old atheism, because that's a, favorite, that's a favorite topic of mine. That's a favorite uh, uh, punching bag for almost any philosopher in the world, so... Maybe. Let me know. Let me know if you'd like to see that. Angry 17-year-old atheism. Now, this refers to the type of resentment-fueled anti-God vibes that you might observe amongst sartorially gothic teens hanging out at suburban American malls. Now, you can imagine these folks scrawling God is dead on the covers of their textbooks or carrying around a paperback copy of Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra that they uh, probably haven't actually read. And while Nietzsche was sure... It doesn't matter if they read it or not. Here's the thing. So when you're when you're 17 or when you're in high school at all, or quite frankly, when you're an undergraduate, you probably shouldn't read Nietzsche. I did. Of course, uh, I didn't I didn't buy into it in this in this angry 17 year old atheist way. Thank God. Um, there but for the grace of God go I, so to speak. But at the same time, Nietzsche is a very sophisticated and a very. He's a very deconstructivist thinker, right? Nietzsche in his writings is very, very carefully nested within a an ancient tradition going, going all the way through the Western canon. 
Uh, he is as familiar with uh, with Plato and Aristotle as any Platonist or Aristotelian scholar would be. Uh, now, that isn't to say he gets everything right, but he is he is intimately excuse me intimately familiar with uh, the works of almost the entirety of the Western canon. And because of this, he carefully references all of them, and then he criticizes and deconstructs as much of it as he can get his hands on, which is quite a lot. The problem with approaching Nietzsche as an angry 17-year-old is that you don't have this same knowledge and the same grasp on the entirety of the Western canon, uh, partially because our modern you know, high schools drop the ball horribly when it comes to classical education, but, but more, more importantly, just because you're too young, right? Um, Nietzsche, I always say Nietzsche should not be your first philosopher. You shouldn't, you probably shouldn't even be in your first five or ten. Uh, Nietzsche should be something that you read once you have a really solid grasp on the history of Western thought. Um, because he had a really solid grasp on the history of Western thought, and he and he took it very seriously in his deconstruction of uh, of that tradition. And so even if even if these, you know, 17-year-olds that he's talking about had read uh, Thus Spoke Thar Zarathustra or, or Beyond Good and Evil, which which is probably an edgier title, so they'd probably have that one instead. Um, but either way, even if they had read it, they wouldn't get it. They would get it enough to be annoying, which is definitely the case. That happens all the time. But they wouldn't get it enough to actually understand what's being said, to 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 fully grasp the the criticisms being leveled and their significance, especially there's the sort of... Um, uh, the echoes of their significance for other uh, other realms of thought, other other sets of ideas, the kind of thing that I assume he's going to be talking about uh, to some degree, at least moving forward, this this sort of Nietzsche being a crit critic of atheism, that whole thing. So I, I like the analogy, really, of uh, something like that, uh, that, yeah, Nietzsche should not be your first philosopher uh, any more than, say, The Last Jedi should be your first Star Wars movie. Um, now, Nietzsche is a better writer than Ryan Johnson, that goes without saying, almost anyone is. Uh, but um, the, the point is that The Last Jedi, or maybe for a better example, Knights of the Old Republic 2 should not be your first Star Wars game. Uh, now, if you haven't played the Knights of the Old Republic games, I have live streams where I played the whole things. So check that out. I'll put, I'll put links as well down below. But um, the second uh, Knights of the Old Republic 2 was a, was a deconstruction uh, in this very, very postmodern literary sense, a deconstruction of the Star Wars mythology. And so that should not in any way be the first piece of Star Wars media that you that you approach, or even the first Star Wars game that you play. Um, any more than Friedrich Nietzsche should be the first philosopher that you read, because if you don't have this solid grasp on how the world that we're examining and then deconstructing actually works, the deconstruction is going to be hollow, and you're going to get all of the wrong messages from it. You're just going to get uh, you're just going to get meanness from it. You're not going to get significance from. That isn't to say, again, that isn't to say that Nietzsche is a bad philosopher or KOTOR 2 is a bad game. Uh, or even, that's not even to say that The Last Jedi is a bad movie. It is, but that's not the point. Nietzsche was a brilliant philosopher. He got a lot wrong, but he was a brilliant philosopher. It's just that you can't approach him right out of the gate because of the, because of the massive amount of background that you require. Surely being critical of the religious proclivities of his day when he penned his famous mantra, our 17-year-old brains often miss the subtlety of what he's really saying. So if Nietzsche's most infamous three words don't literally translate to God is dead, be an atheist, uh, only idiots believe in magical sky daddies, and big boys use reason and not belief, well then what do they mean? I mean, it kind of does... Mm, it's not that he believes that only idiots believe in God, it's that... God is, a, the, the belief in God is not a viable option or a viable alternative given the developments that he saw proceeding in society. So it was basically a large part of the God is dead mantra, that, that whole idea, is that, the, that our belief in God is in large part a, uh, an artifact of society and that society was moving in a direction where that where that artifact is has lost its usefulness, has lost its applicability, and 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 basically can only go away. And now he was, uh, you know, factually wrong about that. If, he, if we're talking about prediction, because of course he was. I mean, the gates of hell should not prevail, and neither will the gates of Frederick Nietzsche. All right. So, I mean, 
it is it is to an extent it's a it's a it's a reasonable reading to say that Nietzsche is saying that that only a only an odd group of people only particularly strange folks uh in the in the near to long term future uh will be Christians right you'd have to be weird to be one uh or weird to believe in God. Uh, or even perhaps, uh, perhaps even dumb to believe in God in in an odd sense, but but um, but not for the reasons that uh, that the edgy seventeen year old atheist might think that that well, it's just a stupid fairy tale that sort of thing. It's not that right. But but Nietzsche did certainly think that belief in God is uh, is untenable given um, social, cultural, and philosophical. Uh, developments in and after his time, as far as he, uh, as far as he could predict them. Again, turned out to be wrong, but yeah. it, it's more sophisticated than it looks. But it's not. Uh, it's, it's not. Uh, it's not the opposite of what it looks like. Let's put it that way. To understand that, we need to consider both the text in which he uses the phrase and the philosophical and intellectual climate in which he was writing. To offer an almost that's incredibly historicist, and I mean, while that is very Nietzschean in a sense. Um, I, I could tell this guy's uh, rather continental in terms of his school of thought. Um, he's to to place right to place um, to place a philosopher strictly within their historical context and to and to use that as a lar as a major determinant of of what what they're saying could mean right as a uh, as a primary uh, interpretive criterion. That is a very continental attitude as opposed to an analytic attitude. That, that, that is something that I tend not to hold too strongly to, but um, I, can see this, I can see the strength of it because it can lend additional context, right? but, but I'm a little cautious and I will warn you here that I think that I'm afraid what he might be doing is, is what continentals often do, what, what continental historians of philosophy will often do, which is to to historicize a particular philosopher and their thought to the extent that they, because their ideas are so historically contextualized, they are set within this very particular moment of time, they are not broadly applicable outside of that. And the best that we can do to apply it to our time period is to understand what they said in their context and say something that is uh, similar but relevant to our context, but it would be it would wind up being something different, and so it's a it's almost at its worst a kind of polylogism, a kind of uh, a kind of temporal relativism, if you want to think of it that way. So, word of caution again. I I, uh, I don't know if this is quite where he's going with this. If this is if it's going to be quite so extreme, but red flags are starting to pop up for me. And the philosophical and intellectual climate in which he was writing. To offer an almost offensively quick TLDR of philosophy, since the medieval oh no. era, almost oh no. all Western philosophy. I mean, okay. All right, so. Yeah, I'm offended. All right, okay. Starting a TLDR of philosophy with the medieval era, as much as, as, much as I like the medieval era, as much as everyone should like the medieval era. The history of philosophy did not start with Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was the inheritor of a very long tradition and was a developer of that tradition. And it it would and even in the context of what Nietzsche has to say, Nietzsche criticizes Plato and Aristotle as much as he criticizes the scholastics. But I don't know why he's jumping into the history of philosophy in the 13th century. That's this is a bizarre way of approaching this. Mm. I will say at least this is uh, this is better than he has done in the past. Actually, both uh, both presenters on this channel that I've I've reacted to have have made the uh, the very modernist but very common mistake of assuming that the history of philosophy began in I don't know the 17th century or so, and that the that the medievals were just doing well I don't know having a nap or something and we're not actually doing philosophy so we don't have to pay attention to it or something like that and that that's um that's a really common outlook and it's a it's a it's an outlook that we have seen before from this very channel so uh, at least he's reaching back into the medieval period though why he's not reaching past the medieval period back into the the classical world is a, is a strange mystery to me especially given historical studies uh, that were particularly relevant to Nietzsche and his writings and his interests and all that I would think that if you're if you're I would think that if you're looking at Nietzsche as a deconstructor of the Western canon, which is what's going on here, 
you would start with Plato, because that's where the Western canon starts. I mean, you can start with Homer. Nietzsche, actually, actually never mind. No, Nietzsche kind of does start with Homer, if I remember right. He has a lot to say there. So, never mind, you have to go further back. <laughs> oh, man. All right, whatever. Let's, uh, let's see what he has to say about my beloved medievals. He had some type of formal relationship with religion. Now, for some people like Descartes, it was pretty literal because he argued that the existence of God is what ensures the consistency of rationality. Now, for others, it was the basis for their non-religious moral philosophy. All right, so basically he just goes, the medievals thought about God, <clears throat> and then the, the real philosophers in the modern period, they also thought about God. Okay, so yeah. Um, yeah, he's, he is doing exactly the thing that I was, I was accusing him of doing before, which is, which is forgetting that anything happened before the early modern period, before roughly Descartes. So, all right, great. We see this with Kant's categorical imperative, which is basically love your neighbor as yourself, except we do it because of rational principles and not divine commands. No, but I mean, it's close enough. It's close enough, I guess. And again, his rational principles depend upon things like um, like a, a numinal world beyond our uh, our ability to to comprehend using our ordinary uh, ordinary sense capacities and rationality. Um, it involves things like a common uh, and, and non-empirical common human nature such that we can we can coherently universalize our ethical precepts. It, it involves a lot that modern atheists would consider, if not supernatural, at least spooky. But 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 again, whenever. I mean he's going he's going uh, what he what he did already admit to be a uh, an insultingly brief TLDR summary. So yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, fair enough. I mean, he's getting to the point, which which is fair, I suppose, that um, that there is a a long tradition of assuming that. <clears throat> okay. On one reading of the Western canon. There is a long tradition of assuming that there is something beyond the merely natural world, at least beyond the merely physical, uh, the, the simply material, which lends the world its moral character. That moral facts exist, but that they are non-physical, that they, they go beyond the natural world in some, uh, in some significant capacity. Um, now, that said, that is entirely contrary to the natural law tradition. That is much more of an enlightenment idea than it is a, uh, a classical or medieval idea. Uh, the natural law tradition which was most prominent in the Middle Ages, but, but you know, goes all the way back to Aristotle and arguably Plato. And if you're, again, if you're interested in this, check out my playlist on the subject. I'm, I'm teaching my ethics class on this. Um, that, that moral facts or uh, values and such are not in any way supernatural. They are part of the nature of the things that they are about. To say that I am a human being is to say that I have uh, I have certain duties and obligations, and I have certain values inherent to me, and I have, have certain ends that are intrinsic to my being as a human being. And then to say otherwise is to say that I would be a different kind of creature. My go to my go to example for this is uh, is that uh, it, we can, in fact, straightforwardly, and this is on a on a strictly on even a sort of Thomistic model, uh, what what atheists would consider supernaturalist that. Um, so believing in God and believing in the ordaining of uh, of the world and etc., <clears throat> that we um, we derive our ethical principles both in the in the the meta ethical stand uh, uh, level the, the very abstract principles and all the way down to the the very particular ethical principles entirely from the natures of the things themselves of the the of the natural world in in that sense, um, and so I like to say something like uh, a good example of this is. We know that murder is wrong, given that we are a particular kind of creature, right? We are mortal. Uh, we are rational animals. Part of that means that we exist in communities, and part of that means that we are mortal. We, we, we die, right? We, if you kill us, we die. Um, now, the prohibition against murder would not exist if we were not mortal. Uh, I point to the perfect example of this, which is that in a, say, in a video game, um, particularly a multiplayer video game where death is impermanent, where when you die, you respawn. Killing someone is not murder. I mean, it is. It is murder. It's just not wrong. Because the kind of thing that you are representing in that game is not the kind of thing 
which is um, damaged in the very same way that murder damages a human being uh, under ordinary, you know, living circumstances. And so, if we were immortal, if say you would you would naturally respawn at the last the last bed that you slept in or something, whatever your your spawn point designated spawn point. If you naturally respawned, if you were killed, then we would not have a reason not to kill each other. Now we might have other reasons not to kill each other, the same reasons you might not you might have in a video game, right? That it that it's rude, right? Uh, you know, killing somebody is rude, or it might be you're killing somebody to take their stuff, and maybe you shouldn't take their stuff, right? But um, killing somebody intrinsically would not be uh, even murder intrinsically would not be wrong if we were a fundamentally different kind of creature. And so we, we derive our ethical precepts from the natures of the things involved in, uh, in the ethical deliberation, including our own natures. And that is strictly natural, even, even if we don't think that, um, that our natures are purely material and that that matters, right? Because we're not purely material. That means we have ends that go beyond the, the mere animality of ourselves, yada, yada, yada. And so again, atheists will say that's spooky and supernatural and stuff, but, Again, it's fundamentally about the nature of the things involved, and so it's not supernatural in the sense that it's divine command. And he's making it sound like um, it's making he's making it sound like before Kant we had divine command theory, and then Kant comes up with with uh, rational deontology or something. Which no, come on, divine command theory was incredibly rare in the medieval period. You only found it in a few minority views, um, primarily in primarily in by Islamic scholars, but even there it wasn't a majority position. Uh, not until much, much later. So no. Uh, anyway, of course, th this is this is a natural, uh, very common, and uh, very predictable, given that it's wisecrack uh, misunderstanding of uh, of medieval philosophy. But what would modern philosophy be if not a grand misunderstanding of medieval philosophy? Now, when the Enlightenment came around, God was replaced by human reason as the ultimate source of truth and meaning. But even so and how'd that turn out for us? <laughs> Oh gosh! I, I, I... We invented genocide. That's all I have to say. We invented genocide and furries. Great job, reason. So Western philosophy still felt pretty, you know, like Christiany. It remained indebted to the structures of Christian thinking for a while, even if the philosophies themselves were often overtly atheistic. I mean, yes, because again, <clears throat> this is this is neglecting the fact that 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 Christian thought was fundamentally predicated upon the identity of God with reason. This goes back to uh, the prologue to the Gospel of John, uh, where uh, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. So the Logos here just means reason, or rationality, or logic, or, or word, or language, or speaking, or foundational principle of reality, whatever you want to lot in there. Logos is a meaning, is a word with a plethora of meanings. But because of this classical union of God and the divine with human reason, right? human reason being the image and likeness of God, th yeah, it, ma it makes sense that there is a kind of continuity um, with the sort of atheistic rationalists if they're still holding on to rationality in roughly the same way that that uh, the Christian tradition had done, which is more or less true, then yeah, they're just going, they're going to be keeping a lot of holdovers from Christianity because a lot of what made human reason, what makes human reason, is our image and likeness of God. And so it's innate to the Christian theological and philosophical tradition. So you can't jettison all that at once, in other words. Now, I'm making a prediction here. Um, he's going to, at some point, get into the point that Nietzsche... Jetta does, in fact, uh, fully jettison this idea of uh, a, uh, a divine logos, let's say. And so he does make this hard break with Christianity that, excuse me, uh, that atheistic rationalists had not really fully done so uh, before this point. So, okay, maybe I can see why, why he would say that Nietzsche was so re revolutionary. Maybe, okay. Okay, think of it this way. Contemporary pop music in many Do I have to? Okay. Anyways, might seem like it's just done away with the uh, cheesy structures used by an old band like the Beatles. But in actuality, these bands are using the exact same chord structures and scales and rhythms and instruments to make music. The structure is still there, whether or not you want to say 
that John or Paul is dead. Okay, so enter Nietzsche's God is dead from his book, it's The Gay Science. Analogy. In the opening aphorism of book three, New Battles, he writes, after Buddha was dead, they still showed his shadow in a cave for centuries, a tremendous, gruesome shadow. God is dead. But given the way people are, there may still for millennia be caves in which they show his shadow. And we, we must still defeat his shadow as well. In other words, even after God was dead, the shadow or influence of God remained. And people didn't really distinguish between the shadow and the deity itself. In other words, if God was the sun, we had at best a UV resistant umbrella to hide under and try to avoid a sunburn. So I, I, this is one of the things that I don't like about Nietzsche is his, his over-reliance on metaphor. Uh, because it's not exactly clear what he means. He, he never makes it quite clear what he means by we live in that, but by there, there still is the shadow of God in, in some segments of our society. And he leaves that to the reader, to the interpreter, to really, to really reconcile with. And so there, there's an extent to which what he means is relatively clear, coherent, and straightforward that, that there is a sort of a, an ongoing assumption. And this is what Weisbrack is talking about. There's an ongoing assumption or set of assumptions going on in, uh, in Western philosophy that, that find their roots in Christianity, even though Christianity has been excised from it, the, the sort of contours of the tradition are still there and are still shaped by, uh, this historical Christianity, Christianity, excuse me. Um, but we also can talk about this in terms of the social impacts, and we can also talk about this in terms of uh, our, um, well, something that is a, a bit of a tagline of this video, which I think it's in the thumbnail or something, uh, the whole God-shaped hole that, that, um, that I think it's C.S. Lewis who talks about that, uh, that, we, that we possess. Uh, that our uh, our inner selves uh, lead us inexorably to uh, that which that for which we are made, which is ultimately uh, God in heaven. And so Nietzsche can be talking about that as a kind of uh, kind of God's shadow, that there is something missing. And this is actually something that's quite profound about Nietzsche, and that he that he alludes to this in other ways and other times. And so uh, we can, we can we can read this into it that. We are, in fact, missing something really profound, meaningful, and important when we reject theism, when we reject Christianity and religion, um, even if it's false, which we did think it was. Losing out on it's missing something essential to... Excuse me. Uh, missing out on something essential to the human being, to the human character. And so... Like I said, there are there are far too many readings to his various metaphors and, and analogies uh, to just drop them like this. But uh, and, and again, this is this actually tracks with uh, I, this sticks in my mind because Chesterton, uh, G.K. Chesterton, criticized Nietzsche for relying overly much on spatial metaphors in particular by saying that uh, we are beyond good and evil is uh, is just a cowardly way of avoiding saying better than good or more good than good and evil, or something like that, which which is what it, I mean, straightforwardly, that's what it would have to mean, and that's why it winds up being ultimately incoherent. Now, there's something more to it than that. It is something about our uh, our sort of sociological development and all that. That part might be might be perfectly relevant, perfectly useful to consider, but but to say that we um, that the will to power is uh, is normative in some sense that good and evil is not is just to, is just to replace the good with some particular good. And that's just idolatry, and we've been doing it for a very long time. So anyway, that's uh, that, that's this. I think illustrates again one of my one of my little pet peeves about Nietzsche. And why I, why I, well, you think he has some brilliant insights? It, it's kind of hard to mine them out of a lot of what he says. Now this phrase comes back later in Book Three in an aphorism called "The Madman." Now Nietzsche tells the story of a madman who runs around the marketplace with a lantern, crying incessantly, "I'm looking, looking for God! I'm looking for God!" Immediately, the madman is mocked. Now, since many of those who did not believe in God were standing around together just then, he caused great laughter. The madman replies to this mockery by saying, Where is God? I'll tell you. We have killed him. You and I. We are all his murderers. Now, note that he says that many of those 
who did not believe in God were standing together just then. Meaning that this madman wasn't talking to, you know, religious yokels, but that he was in a context where there was other atheists and it was normal to not believe in God. So the problem here for the madman is that no one else really realizes the magnitude of the death of God. And this Okay, yeah, that's that's a that is a really significant point and that is actually a point worth making. Um and that is one of one of Nietzsche's key uh, key insights is that is that we that there are serious uh, social, moral, personal, psychological, etc. implications and follow-on effects of of this kind of this kind of cultural relinquishment of the idea of God of this cultural atheism. Echoes the passage we already read from New Battles in which God is dead, but we still need to defeat his shadow. Again, the important thing here is that Nietzsche isn't just saying a. Uh, God is dead, religious folks are dummies, I'm the number one atheist boy. He's saying that those celebrating the death of God without adequately reckoning with the shadow are missing the point. I'll give you another example. Um, it reminds me of a thing they used to talk about when I went to Christian youth group. In you kind of missed, I'm gonna go back a second. <clears throat> he kind of missed what the point is. I mean, he says we're missing the point, but then he, I, I, wish, I wish this had been organized a little better so you then make the point because I don't know, maybe he will. There's still, there's still, you know, 13 minutes left of the video. So there's, there's a chance he will make the point at some point, but um, the point that Nietzsche was making uh, is that when it, to celebrate the death of God, right? The death of God is not something to be celebrated. It, it is, uh, it's something to be observed at best, maybe even mourned. There are times when he seems to be even a bit mournful about this because it's a sort of, he sees it as, as, as man, man qua species getting its youthful naivete right so coming of age in a sense and coming of age is not merely something to celebrate it is something uh it, there is something to mourning the loss of one's childhood and one's childhood innocence because going into the adult world is very difficult and it comes with all sorts of additional challenges and so navigating the world without this uh without this idea of god without this this um this this god-shaped hole as, he, as he's about to go on to say i'm sure um that is uh, a whole hell of a lot more difficult and there's uh, there are challenges that come with that um and, and again that is uh that, that's something that he could have really taken a moment to bring up here but uh i guess he wants to explain more about the missing of the point before he gets to the point, but I feel like you know getting to the point would be handy here. But all right, well, let's get to the god-shaped hole thing because I think this is from C.S. Lewis. I, I could be wrong. That 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 language. I'll give you another example. Um, it reminds me of a thing they used to talk about when I went to Christian youth group in high school, which was the god-shaped hole in all our hearts. Now, there you go. when youth pastors used this, they were talking about how if you're having sex or doing drugs or listening to the Wu Tang Clan. You're just filling a hole that should be filled by God. That's absolutely not what that is usually. I mean, I don't know. I don't I don't travel in Protestant youth group circles, but that's not what that that's not the point there at all. That was certainly not Lewis's point. And I know Lewis uses the analogy. I don't know if he initiated or originated the analogy, but he uses it. And he uses this to point to the fact that there is a, there is that there must be something that is fundamentally beyond um, that which is merely this world, that which is merely human, that which is merely social, um, and that is because there is a. Uh, and he talks about this in um, in the section on uh, in in mere Christianity on joy, if I remember right. I know he also talks about it in his autobiography, surprised by joy. He talks about this a lot in there too. That. Um, that there is some there's some desire that we have right a god-shaped hole so to speak that goes beyond the the mere oh, excuse me the mere um the merely physical the merely social the merely human and and so this indicates that uh if there is a natural desire for something it means that we are in some sense designed for or oriented towards or or ordered towards that something and that therefore that something is a thing it's real that there is something beyond that we strive towards and this is this is also very much in line with his ideas about uh the various uh the various religions of the world having certain commonalities and there being this this um co-development of 
of theological and spiritual ideas across across human history and across the across the human world. Um, so yeah, I think that that <laughs> to think that there are there are I'm sure very Protestant youth bastards who are saying, well, there's this God shaped hole that you got to fill with God and not with not with what did he say Wu Tang Clan and sex or something like no like sex drugs and rock and roll I guess is the the, the go to thing but no that is not that's not how I've ever heard that term used uh, it's not the the application of that uh, that analogy that I've ever heard but again maybe I'm lucky <laughs> in that I am from a serious faith tradition and not from you know Bob's evangelical uh, church and church and bar and grill from down the street I don't know. Uh, anyway, let's let's see uh, let's see let's see him land the joke. Now, oh, Nietzsche worries that, song, so. that folks are celebrating the death of God without realizing that new beliefs and systems are just unconsciously filling that same hole. In other words, Nietzsche wants to destroy your hole. Don't say that. Any any religion that is three quarters of your religion. Because you got to use your holes the right way. Now, in his telling, the madman goes on to ask, but how did we do this? How were we able to drink up the sea? What were we doing when we unchained... Well, I, I'm going to go back a second. Use to, your holes um, the right way. So, I, I think we have some... I don't want to psychologize. Because I'm not a psychologist. Right? It's not my discipline. I don't know this guy well enough to do so in a responsible manner. And so... Know that I'm not a clinician. Know that I'm not a psychologist. Know that I don't have a degree in psychology. I have a degree in philosophy, which happens to be the same degree as this guy. So we, we I at least, I hope and I think, understand something about his thought processes here, such as they are. But I have to say, this reads like projection of really pent up issues from. Um, let's say a uh, an ill-spent youth plagued by Christian guilt and or a fundamentally unserious Christian upbringing and or I might even go far, so far as to say something like spiritual abuse. He talks about things like purity culture a lot too from, from other videos I've seen. And I get the impression that God, I've always, I've always said, and this is, this is sad but true, I know far more atheists who used to be evangelicals that I know evangelicals. Particularly like not not so much mainline Protestants, but the but the the fundamentalist evangelical types, which I get the impression is what he's talking about here as is sort of growing up with this. That this kind of fundamental and seriousness about religion is what can easily lead one to atheism. Um, because the moment something even vaguely intellectual shows its face, we're immediately drawn to it because there is a God-shaped hole in us. And that shape looks a lot like reason because God is reason. And so when things start making sense, well, when somebody says something that starts making sense and that person is an atheist and they make atheism sound like it makes sense, you're going to jump ship if your ship is that pathetic and that leaky. It's, 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 sad but it's incredibly common so uh, again i think that uh that maybe he ought to maybe he needs to reconcile a little bit with his own uh with his own spiritual history uh if he's going to take these kinds of questions seriously uh even before we can manage to uh to take take seriously the the, the point that Nietzsche brings up about uh, about our uh our as a species uh reconciling with uh, with the death of god now, in his telling, the madman goes on to ask, but how did we do this? How were we able to drink up the sea? What were we doing when we unchained the earth from its sun? Where is it moving to now? Where are we moving to? How can we console ourselves? The murderers of all murderers. The holiest and muddiest thing the world has ever possessed has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood from us? There is never a greater deed. And whoever is born after us will on account of this deed belong to a higher history than all history up to now. Very much like I said, it's it's 
in part, it is a lament for a loss of innocence and a loss of innocent youth. Um, and also, it's again, it's a kind of it's a kind of moving forward, a moving onward to a uh, to a greater future, but one which is more difficult and comes with all of these various difficulties that uh, that we we formerly had to we formerly had something like religion to fall back on or this God idea to 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 help us along with, so to speak. It, it, it is in that sense you can see where the sort of new atheists get their idea that religion is a kind of crutch. Uh, that it's a that it is uh, in compensation for our human weaknesses. I mean, Nietzsche certainly thought so clearly right here. Um, but also, I mean, we Christians think this as well, right? That that God is there to support us in our weaknesses, uh, and that's why we have religion is that we aren't perfect, right? We we accept human fallenness and all, all that. So, yeah, I think that um, yeah, this is this is uh, this is a profound thing to say, and it's uh, it's it's. Ultimately, it rests on a false, uh, the, the false proposition that the idea of God is untenable. It's certainly, I mean, it's obviously not untenable. Um, there, there, it was very common and very popular in and, and even leading up to Nietzsche's time to, to, to speculate that uh, the idea of religion was sort of falling away. Um, far from the truth, that hasn't uh, that, that hasn't been borne out. Uh, there are all sorts of thinkers, and uh, Voltaire probably even uh, probably even just as famously, or if not more famously, uh, pointed out that like, in a hundred years um, there would be uh, there'd be no use for a Bible other than as a historical artifact. And you know, it's been it's been way more than a hundred years, and that's uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, again, I think that he was uh, I think he was wrong historically and wrong theologically, but he, he was absolutely wrong psychologically. He was, uh, sorry, he was actually absolutely right psychologically, uh, and and I think even sociologically in in pointing out and noticing the fact that we, if we are to abandon our belief in God, that has serious, severe repercussions for the rest of our philosophical outlook on the world. But the people in the marketplace just looked at him in silence. My farts don't sound anything like that. My farts are long and way louder, and they reek. He then says, I come. Why did that clip go on so long? That, mm, okay. Come too early, throws his lantern on the ground so it smashes, and says, my time is not yet. This deed is still more remote to them than the remotest stars. And yet, they have done it themselves. Now, it sounds a little dramatic, and it is, but the idea is that people don't even realize what they've done by killing God. And almost as an afterthought, the aphorism adds that later that day, the madman forced himself into several churches, attempted to sing a funeral rite for God, and then, when let out, replied, What then are these churches now, if not the tombs of God? Okay, but let's really reflect on the Madman passage, which is distinct from the Mad Men passage, and that's where Donald Draper convinces a board full of McDonald's executives that the Big Mac will become a new god to a spiritually empty and hungry American consumer. Uh, I don't know exactly how close that is to Blood Mad Men. I have not seen Mad Men. But I have to assume that you're completely... I assume that was an attempt at a joke, but that either I didn't get it because I haven't seen Mad Men, or that it was just not very good. Let me know in the comments, was that a good joke that I didn't understand, or was I correct in my assessment that that was really forced, really desperately forced? Now here it seems that Nietzsche isn't targeting, you know, like religious idiots, but rather he's targeting people Oh, oh, it's the professional quote. Okay, 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 okay. I'm sorry, I have to talk about this. I have really have to talk about this because I, I have wanted to talk about this for a long, long time. So, okay, this, um, we laugh a lot at this now. Even more so than at the time. It was really funny at the time, but it's even funnier now. Um, but because we live outside of the weird little zeitgeist of, gosh, what, uh, the, the mid-2000s through early 2010s, give or take, when... Uh, when quotes these deracinated, decontextualized little half sentences were kind of were of unbelievable popularity. They were the early. They were some of the earliest of internet memes. 
were these quotes. And very often, they would be placed on images. You'd have a, uh, a quote, like, in this moment I am euphoric, and the rest of it. Um, placed on, you know, uh, on a picture of the guy with a fedora or something, right? Or whatever. Um, or the, you know, galaxy brain or whatever it was. You'd have a, um, you'd have a quote and that would, that would go viral like a meme, uh, like a meme does today. And it would, it wouldn't matter where the quote came from. Usually, uh, very often it was, it was kind of common practice. And I, I will see this in my cringy Facebook memories as well. Uh, you'll find, uh, lots of unattributed quotes just floating around the internet, completely unattributed. It's not even, they were, there was not even like an attempt at attempted attribution, or maybe in this case, it was, uh, you know, a, a screen name attribution or something like that. Um, so we, we, we uh, in the early developments of meme culture, what we wound up doing was we, we wound up just sort of plucking quotes out of, well, books, movies, TV shows, our asses, whatever it might be. And, um, <clears throat> And just sort of spreading it around, uh, and and there was no concern for anything like context, and so the idea of a professional quote maker wasn't the most absurd thing in the world. Like I, I even in high school, which was around this time, I came up with quotes, which again, what, what really that just amounts to is vaguely clever little turns of phrase that. Uh, that I that I would use on occasion, and other people would pick up sometimes. Like that that's all that was. That's all that meant. Right? And so the assumption from a lot of people was that that quotes were something that you could find or make, and that they had of in and of themselves some kind of significance, you know, apart from the text they come from, which <clears throat> was a huge problem for uh, for academia for a little while as well, and it affected and infected uh, probably a lot of my papers. I don't really know in retrospect, but even when I first started teaching, this was an issue. Like quotes were just sort of plopped into papers as uh, as if they were just sort of this standalone thing that had no that needed no context or had no context, um, rather than as part of what someone is trying to say. Right. So yeah, this was this was a big cultural thing around that, and it wasn't just the the like cringy Reddit atheists. It was everybody. Everybody did this. So it, again, the, the fact that this is this resulted from it, yeah, th this guy <clears throat> was unbelievably cringe. Um, we would have had other words for him back then, but I probably can't say them on YouTube. Um, but but no, this was a this was a big cultural thing at the time, and I, I don't know. It, it's not relevant to the point that he's making here, really, at all. But I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and this kind of quote culture. Uh, from I don't know fifteen twenty years ago, and uh, and how this this was the apotheosis of that uh, of the worst elements of that culture. Anyway, let's go on. Let's get back to talking about Nietzsche and uh, something that's vaguely philosophically serious. Already identified as atheists. Of course, it could also be said that many religious folks are also in denial about the death of God, which is especially ironic to Nietzsche because the death of God is, in a way, Christianity's literal truth. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Christian theology, the whole deal is that Jesus, who is also God, dies on the cross and is then resurrected, making the death of God the main event. While the Christians missing the point about the death of God have hands as clean as those of Pontius Pilate, the atheists are even more complicit. Wait, so how do Christians miss the point about the death of God? Because we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection is in the order of the Mass that we sing every Sunday. Well, maybe you don't. I mean, you you grew up in evangelical, but you don't do that, I suppose. But for the rest of us, the rest of us who are part of historical Christianity, we we kind of we create we preach one thing, and that is Christ crucified, and that's a biblical quote. So that's Saint Paul, right? You know that. So I don't know. I don't know how or why he's using. Christians are missing the point about God's death. Um, but now, now that is different from saying God is dead, right? Because God is, for fear of uh, quoting a song, um, God is not dead, despite having died. God is alive, uh, having rose from the dead, and that's, you know, that's that's also kind of the point. That's the point of the death of God is that God defeated death, not the death defeated God. Right. Anyway. 
And let's get back to Nietzsche. Because they think God never existed in the first place, they're unable to come to terms with the magnitude of his death. Put differently, they've never acknowledged the massive influence that God has had on human thought and existence. Okay, there's actually two aspects of that that are worth, that are worth, worth uh, analyzing. Uh, one is the point that he is making here, right? But I'll get back to that. The other point that, uh, that he accidentally brought up here, I think, purely accidentally, is that a Christianity and its proclamation of Christ crucified is only a radical idea, an, an almost irreconcilable idea, if you're already an ardent monotheist. If you've gotten to the point of monotheism, and then a Christian missionary tells you, and then God died, and then God was put to death by human hands, that is incredible. Incredible, meaning unbelievable. That is, that is, that is the kind of thing that you can only really reconcile um, by a miracle. But if you're an atheist, and you don't think God is God, or don't think there is a God, or don't think that God is, uh, don't understand that uh, what it means to be God, that in which no greater can be thought, um, ipsum essay, some systems, the, the absolute maximal, maximal perfection, or being itself, it's whatever you want, whatever you want to, however you want to uh, describe God as properly as we can. Atheists who do not comprehend that do not grasp the significance of God's death on the cross, that that is the most significant event of human history, and not just human history, but the history, but the history of all creation. We're we're very quick to say that oh no, we've uh, we've experienced such horrors, say in the last century. This is uh, we might we might point to the Holocaust, or we might point to the the, the killing fields of Cambodia, or we might kill we might point to the uh, uh, the trenches of World War One as uh, as some of as the worst thing that man has ever that man has ever committed, and that's absolutely not right. The worst crime that man has ever committed was putting God to death. And so we, who, who, are, who are willing to grasp that, do understand the, the absurd, I mean almost literally absurd significance, uh, the almost paradoxical significance of the death of God. And therefore, looping back to the point that he is making here, the point that Nietzsche is making primarily, and we are in a position to understand the significance of the death of the idea of God in the common mind. Again, common mind or the, the culture or whatever you want to call it. Again, there's, there's issues here with, with reification of secondary substances, which is something that Nietzsche was kind of prone to at, at times. But I digress. The point is that we are, we are ready to reconcile with the significance of God not existing, if that were the case. Whereas atheists who, by and large, do not understand the concept of God, most atheists who, who don't take the idea of God seriously uh, analogize God to the flying spaghetti monster or something like that. A mere being, perhaps a large and powerful being, but a, but a mere being regardless, right? the, not the substantial grounding of all existence in the way that Christians mean. And so... Atheists, the atheists do not quite understand the significance of saying that God does not exist in the way that Christians, well, philosophically equipped Christians at least, are far more capable of understanding because we've reconciled with the death of God, because we understand what it means for God to live and die and to conquer death in the way that he has on the cross. And as such, aren't able to reckon with the lack of this existential nucleus. It's kind of like how even though Santa isn't real, sorry kids, he has a real effect on Christmas present shopping and fuels a massive portion of the economy each year. Now, it's a really bad analogy, but... First of all, obviously Santa Claus does exist, because if he didn't exist, then there would not be such an effect. Um, but he exists. Again, see my video on the subject and Jonathan Pichot's video on the subject. Santa Claus exists as a kind of interpersonal... Um, an interpersonal being, a kind of secondary substance, the kind of thing that we shouldn't quite reify. So, God, so Santa Claus exists not in the way that God exists, and not even in the way that a human being exists, uh, but in a very real sense. Um, if I were to ask whether or not Santa Claus has a beard, there is a correct answer to that question, right? If you were to say no, you you will have gotten the question wrong. 
And for you to get the question wrong, that means there has to be something for that the, the question has to be about. And for it to be about something, it has to be about something real, at least to some degree, etc. Anyway, anyway, the point being, though, is that uh, this is not a, this is, <laughs> oh, the delicious irony of this. This is a perfect illustration of the point I was just making. It's that atheists are so very quick to analogize God to not even beings, but secondary substances, derivative beings like Santa Claus. Um, they're so quick to analogize God to to man with beard in sky or anything else like this. And a serious Christian, a serious theist at all, really, or even a serious atheist who has reconciled and has reckoned with the significance of the idea of God and the uh, and the significance of the non-existence of God, if, if that is in fact, if that were in fact the case somehow counterfactually, they don't get it right. The the the, the casual atheist, even the the philosophically inclined atheist like our presenter here, doesn't grasp and has not reconciled with the significance of God, even the idea of God and even the non-existence of God, that it is of infinitely greater significance than the non-existence of Santa Claus or the non-existence of any given person or even yourself, right? And so this, the, the very fact that he makes an analogy like this is a perfect illustration of the problem that he is pointing to, except that he doesn't see he's pointing in a mirror. Gotta love this. Gotta love it. We see this throughout book three of The Gay Science where Nietzsche goes pretty hard on critiquing Christian morality. And I think you've probably heard a lot of this stuff before. I talked about it in the video on nihilism that we made earlier this year. Check it out if you haven't. In this critique, Nietzsche points out that Christian morality focuses meaning on heaven and the afterlife so much that people sort of neglect and reject earth and this life, which leads to a kind of nihilism because they're... Again, Protestant thinking, Gnostic thinking again. That is not in any way um, representative of the actual Christian tradition. Um, the actual Christian tradition is very is is almost fundamentally involved in doing good works, doing good works in this world and not just for the next life. And so this is a this is a very very Protestant, maybe even very Calvinist view, if I remember correctly. Nietzsche was was he initially Lutheran or Calvin Calvinist? I can never quite get. I can never quite remember his history. Again, it's outside of my historical area of study, so I'm not sure. But his critique of Christian slave morality, so to speak, or especially not even slave morality, really, his critique of what he's saying here of of Christian morality as being other world focused, uh, focused on the here to come, focused on heaven rather than focused on earth, uh, that whole thing, that is, that is a really Protestant view. Right. That's a really Protestant error that he's critiquing. It's not a Catholic error, and it's not even a traditional Christian error. It's not an not an error that um, say that Orthodox would make either. It's it's a newfangled error by a by a newfangled set of heretics. They're denying their very existence. But Nietzsche goes equally hard at those who place all their belief in things like natural science. Now, in his aphorism, "Let us beware," Nietzsche warns against thinking of the universe as either an organism or a machine, as can be common in natural science. He points out that trying to discover scientific laws is actually a way of deifying nature, i.e. turning nature into our new god. He writes, Let This is interesting because this is also the, the opposite of a lot of his contemporaries. So a lot of Nietzsche's contemporaries, and then also moving forward, um, going so far forward to C.S. Lewis, but even um, Goethe, uh, Goethe was probably the most well known for this idea, and uh, maybe even the originator of this sort of counterpoint to this, which is that in our investigations of the world, we 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 naturalize the mystical. Right? When we investigate the world, we reduce it to mere nature, and so we it's not that we deify nature by investigating it scientifically; it's that we kill nature by investigating it scientifically and so we 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 show a kind of disrespect for the natural world by 
uh, by analyzing it scientifically, and we and the, in doing so, it's not just disrespectful because that I mean that might not matter if the if the world is not sapient in any way, which I don't think it is, um, not in any robust sense. But that we miss important things about the world we are analyzing it, uh, the world we are analyzing by uh, trying to analyze it in this very uh, very naturalistic sort of way. Rather than by rather than deifying it like Nietzsche would have it, so again, this is a this is a fascinating dichotomy that you can have criticisms uh, going in either direction about this, and I think that might actually be correct. We 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 are prone to sort of deifying nature and right? Mother Nature, whole, that whole shebang, um, and the naturalists are very prone to this sort of thing. Materialists, scientists, uh, scientismists, that, that sort of thing, um, but also are are very prone to reductionism about nature. Uh, where where nature is not revered, it is sort of picked apart and deconstructed, which is why we have this sort of this tension in sort of atheistic uh, the atheistic approach to the natural world, where we have a weird dismissal of the natural world, a real weird deconstruction of it, uh, and, in, and a, a kind of innate disrespect for it, but at the same time a kind of reverence for the natural world over and above uh, over and above the human being, like it is God. So um, yeah, I mean, there's an again, there's a weird tension there, and there's there's obviously more to say about it. But you know, let's see, let's let's hear from Nietzsche and see what uh, see what more we can say about uh, uh, this critique as it applies to atheism in particular. Let us beware of saying that there are laws in nature. There are only necessities. There is no one who commands, no one who obeys, no one who transgresses. He's noting the tendency we have to take the structural aspects of theological thinking, i.e. there is a design to all of reality that follows a consistent and well-formed set of principles, and then apply this to the non-human world. In another aphorism, cause and effect. So this is on, um, this is essentially a, uh, an anti-teleological -tele point, but teleological in the sort of William Paley sense of the, the sort of divine watchmaker, not teleology in the sense that there are things which are themselves which have themselves innate tendencies as part of their being. Right? It's a critique of extrinsic teleology, which is which is funny because uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's maybe it's only funny to me because I because I've uh, I've read enough bad essays about William Paley. Um, but this is a criticism of a of a very oh, oh, excuse me a very particular view at a particular time. Uh, which treated the world as if it were um, an artifact, right? Which is not exactly the case, right? It, the world has intrinsic ends rather than extrinsic ends, and this is a this is a a distinction that we can draw from uh, from Aristotle, I believe. Certainly extrapolated for, far more so in, in Aquinas that uh, artifacts, things that we make, have extrinsic ends, right? A bottle, right? If I'm drinking a beer to tolerate this. Um, this has a particular end to it. There's something that this is for, namely, you know, holding Guinness in it. And then the Guinness has certain ends. Uh, but then we can also look further right, into the things which are not particularly um, man-made, right? The alcohol in the Guinness, right? The, the thing that's in here, right? Uh, the components, the natural pieces and parts, the, the natural things, have intrinsic teleology. They are inclined towards, say, um, certain uh, certain biochemical processes in mammals such as myself. And so, in other words, this has a power innate to it to uh, a buzz. I would say drunkenness, but I've only got the one in here. Um, I am trying to trying to stay coherent as best I can through this video. Um, but in any case, right? So it so there are intrinsic ends to things and this is something that isn't touched by this criticism i don't know if it's touched by nietzsche in general and it's it's usually not touched by uh enlightenment and post-enlightenment and sort of modern to middle modern um critiques of uh of religion because sort of modern critiques of religion tend to be focused on the um the almost deistic divine artisan view that things, like natural things, have teleology because God extrinsically grants them teleology. It's not part of their creation as beings, as, as, as natural objects. He questions whether natural science has genuinely advanced human knowledge, writing, we call it explanation, 
But description is what distinguishes us from older stages of knowledge and science. We are better at describing. We explain just as little as our predecessors. The specifically qualitative aspect, for example, of every chemical process still appears to be a miracle, as does every locomotion. No one has explained the push. Exactly what I said. Uh, this is just a result of the denial of intrinsic teleology, which, I mean, yes, it requires the existence of God, but only insofar as being requires the existence of God. Right? Aristotle held to intrinsic teleology, and he didn't he he wasn't exactly a monotheist in the same sense that we might be. So to so know this is uh, this is this is simply and straightforwardly a criticism of the very enlightenment view of the natural world. He's saying that sure, we've gotten a lot better at describing what's going on around us with more detail and specificity. But we haven't gotten that much closer to understanding why or how any of it is actually going down. It's kind of like it's actually very true. I've, I've I've experienced this with a lot of students. Um, a lot of modern students, especially before I really shake them up vigorously and get them get them thinking in a new sort of way, maybe an old sort of way if we're, if we're being uh, historical, they have a hard time grasping end directedness, even of our own choices. Right? We have a hard, they have a hard time distinguishing between, say, for instance, an end that we are pursuing and a foreseen uh, foreseen consequence, uh, or even a foreseen consequence that is a favorable foreseen consequence. That that is a very important difference, but it's one that students have a hard time with because we don't think of we don't think naturally as sort of modern people. We don't think in terms of uh, of teleology, of in terms of ends, in terms of uh, uh, intentionality in that sense, especially not with respect to the natural world. And so, yeah, I think that that is a uh, that is a huge huge problem. That uh, yeah, I think that we do need to uh, that we need to fix that up. But I don't think that that I don't think that that's a result of the death of God. Right, that that we're we still have hangovers from Christianity, and so we're still thinking of things in Christian. No, 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 no. We're still thinking of things in Enlightenment terms, even though we should have abandoned that long ago. Like every time we discover a new star or supernova, we don't get any closer to figuring out why the hell we're here in the first place. We're just <laughs> able to describe the cosmos with more detail. While natural science helped draw an end to a theocentric conception of the universe, where everything revolves around God, it then required its partisans to take on just as much faith in something else as they once had in God. But what about those of you who might be thinking to yourself, Michael, I'm not like other atheists. I'm one of the super smart ones who can see precisely why religion can be so evil and irrational. What would Nietzsche think about me? Well, he might think, that you, you have one thing absolutely right, but potentially some other stuff absolutely wrong. Now, he'd say you're correct in so much as religion, as a moral system, can be an antiquated set of beliefs that at best makes one indifferent to worldly suffering and focused solely on heaven, and at worst, can fuel tribalism, hatred, and war. But um, this actually doesn't get into the issue of master versus slave morality, because that would be awkward and inconvenient, because that is uh, that is... First of all, I mean, honestly, that's probably the most obviously wrong thing that Nietzsche came up with. Um, and it's the thing that is probably the most obviously contrary to even the modern secular view of ethics. That, um, well, I mean, the, the stated modern secular view of ethics, it is, in fact, what a lot of us will, will adhere to, or a lot of, especially a lot of secular, very secular people will adhere to, uh, the kind of the, the will to power and the, uh, the, the, grossly oversimplifying like he's been prone to do um something like might the might makes right ethical sequence uh that that ethics is about accomplishing is about greatness right is about what you can what you can manage to accomplish rather than uh rather than something like benevolence or beneficence so um and that's maybe a little bit it's still a little bit uncharitable but but i'm trying to get it done in a few minutes it's already i've already been here for an hour and 15 minutes um but now the um the idea that uh, that that religious ethics are antiquated and are likely to uh, to give rise to 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 tribalism and to uh, to vicious and violent behavior is almost precisely the contrary to Nietzsche's uh, primary critique of Christian morality. It's that it is that it is first and foremost weak, and it 
uh, it turns weakness into a strength, and so what, what that does is it uh, it allows the weakest and therefore le least capable members of society to uh, to 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 turn their comparative weakness against their betters, and so to, to it sort of winds up inverting the natural social order, and that that's the that's the kind of idea of his uh, of his his uh, description of uh, of Christianity as slave morality, and of course he leaves that out because we don't want to we don't want to think that that is something worth criticizing we want to we want to embrace that that kind of idea and we might even wind up taking it too far perhaps but the idea is out the idea is sound right and that, that's that's part of why christianity turned the ancient world upside down and Nietzsche was actually right about that historically speaking but nietzsche brings up this aspect of his death of god material alongside what can be read as a critique of the type of scientism associated with new atheist thinkers like richard dawkins and daniel dennett New atheists often compare the idea of God to a flying spaghetti monster, i.e. a dumb and made-up deity, for the purpose of saying both ideas are equally as stupid. This is what I was talking about earlier, that this is a, that we should be able to recognize this as an absurd comparison just due to the, 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 uh, the lack of comprehension of, uh, of God qua that than which no greater can be conceived, uh, being itself. But this fails to take seriously the entire legacy of Christian thought in the West, for which God very much did exist. Now, to use a contemporary analogy, even if Q doesn't actually exist, to understand the effects of QAnon on weird aunts and uncles around the world, and then to stem its negative influence, we gotta take the idea of Q seriously. That's not his point. right? That's absolutely not Nietzsche's point at all. It's not that we have to take the idea that Christians believe in God seriously. Right? It's not like it's not like Nietzsche is criticizing the it's not even like he's criticizing people who think that Christians are un, are are faking it, right? Or that or that they haven't reconciled with the implications of the existence of God. Because a lot of atheists like a lot of atheists maybe get it wrong, but they're actually quite serious about trying to figure out um, what kinds of negative things religion can lead to, right? That's where we get the whole new atheist movement and uh, the, the kind of opposition, this very strong, uh, even moral opposition to religion throughout the early 20th century. Um, and, and a lot of it was, again, a lot of it was in response to 9-11, Right, that that was a that was a major factor, and uh, th th this is why there was kind of a slogan for "Science flies you to the moon, religion flies you into buildings." Right, they 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 would, they would chant this. So no, they, I, I don't think that we fail to, or even the the new atheists fail to reconcile with the effects of religion. Rather, they fail to reconcile the, with the, or they fail to to sufficiently understand such that they can criticize the ideas of religion so i think he's i think i think he's getting this this criticism fundamentally wrong because the the q example i mean i, I always find the q thing i i always whenever i hear somebody talking about q i did just my my scholar instincts pop off and i have to either i have to wait a moment to try and figure out whether they're talking about like modern q and on or the 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 hypothetical uh, gospel source for for Mark and Luke, is it Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or the or no no it's Matthew and Mark. That's it. There was Matthew and Mark come from one the hypothetical source Q, um, and Luke or something like that. Again, there's no there's no evidence for this. There's there's only textual similarity stuff. Which yeah. anyway though, right? My point my point is that uh, I, uh, I I often will. I will often initially confuse the two until it comes up. Anyway, um, more fundamentally, if if as he's saying there is no there is no substance to uh, to Q or this this uh, this this source of ideas for QAnon. Now maybe we can talk about its significance. Okay, maybe in this context, its significance is something like the the collective ideas and the community that forms on the basis of those ideas or something like that. But even that is not in the realm of what Nietzsche is talking about, right? He's not talking about the significance of the Christian church or the community of Christians or the, the history of Christian behavior or ideas or thought or whatever. No, that's not it. It's the significance of the idea of God 
and the the philosophical and ethical and social implications of that idea that atheists are not particularly that unserious sort of new atheists are not willing to reconcile with in other words to acknowledge that in some way q does have existential effects because enough people believe in it in a contemporary context we're able to understand reality and morality without a reference to the divine but in refusing to take seriously the legacy of theocentric thought, we are setting ourselves up to repeat it. Now, to get back to... It's not... Again, that's not... It's not that... Oh, my God. It's not that... Nietzsche's point is not that we are failing to see how it is that Christians derive their views from the, from the belief in God. No, that, that was, that, that's been done. Like, in the early Enlightenment, that was a thing. Like, the atheists throughout the early modern period were, were very... Uh, insistent about that sort of thing. Th there's nothing there. Um, there's nothing. There's nothing missing there, right? In other words, it's 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 just that it's that atheists have always gotten that, and that was one of the only things that atheists are, are actually quite serious about is this idea that well, Christianity has this these far-reaching social effects that we have to that we have to take seriously, or religion, like if there is a coherent concept called religion, but believe in god let's say um has these sort of far-reaching social effects okay sure fine yeah all right because but but they're still treating it as as they're still acting as if it's a dumb fairy tale rather than reconciling with what the contents of the belief actually are and that's nietzsche's point his point is that that we fail to understand what the idea said to be false actually is and if you can't say what's false you can't act you can't say what's true you actually have to have a good a good grasp on what in fact is not the case if you are an atheist if you, what you think is what you think is false in order to know what its implications are that's that's crucial and man is he missing the point to our q comparison if we were just to say that q is for paranoid idiots so we don't need to understand it we're risking creating a world where conspiracy can just run rampant with very dark and real effects Okay, that's actually a good point. It's not the point Nietzsche's making at all. But it is a good point, right? So that we, um, by just casually dismissing people we think are dumb um, and not carefully examining why they think what they think um, and not carefully examining the, even the content of their beliefs, we, we, can, um, we can sort of add fuel to the fire, so to speak. So yeah, I think that's a fair point. I've talked about this in the context of flat earthism as well. Right, that, that that it is important to to notice how it is that this kind of thing can happen, how this how these ideas can spread. Because because flat earthism, I mean, Q is is there's not good evidence for it, obviously, um, but you can see why it's plausible because it's wrapped in a lot of layers of secrecy, and so so it 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 makes sense. You can make sense of the holes in the theory as being layers of secrecy, that kind of thing, right? Flat Earthism works far better as a, as a silly kind of conspiracy theory because um, you, you can literally go observe the curvature of the Earth, right? So, like, go to a lake, stand, see some, go look at something across the lake, and then, like, notice the lowest point. So if you're looking at, say, a flagpole, you can see, uh, you can see it, like, here at the base of it, right? When you're standing at the edge of a lake. And then lie down, you will be able to see about that much of the flagpole. Some of it will disappear over the horizon as you lower your head towards the ground. Uh, that is actually observing the curvature of the Earth. You, in fact, can do this if you have a lake near you that is at least I don't know, half a mile wide, if you get good eyes or maybe binoculars. So yeah, it's um, the, the curvature of the Earth is literally observable. Um, medieval peasants knew the world was round. This is not. This is not. This was painfully obvious. Uh, it always has been to everybody, basically. But. Lots of people believe it. And so we have to understand what exactly the content of that belief is. And it involves a lot of, uh, a lot of um, distrust for, uh, for institutional thought and all sorts of things like that. And so understanding why it is that people believe these things, uh, because they form communities having to do with it, because of uh, sort of interconnectedness due to the internet and the, 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 the possibility of, of uh, forming artificial communities, um, because of distrust for institutions, all of that can tell us really important social things. 
even from a really silly idea. And that's actually a really solid point. We should not be so quick to simply dismiss or worse yet, try and stomp out, like forcibly stomp out bad ideas. Um, reconciling with those ideas and understanding why it is, understanding the sort of network of thought that that, that, that idea finds itself in uh, winds up being very important for, for our understanding of each other and our understanding of our society. So yeah, that's a fair point. It's not Nietzsche's point, at, even slightly, but it's a good point. Now, this is what Nietzsche is getting at when he's no, it's not. critiquing atheism. As by not fully reckoning with the legacy of God, new ideas and systems will simply replace the position once held by God. Science becomes God. The media becomes God. Capital becomes God. Political ideology becomes God. The YouTube algorithm becomes God. <laughs> I mean, th this is... This is just... This is just what we mean by what we have always meant by idea uh, by idolatry. So I mean, this isn't a new idea. This isn't a new criticism. Um, this is uh, this is I forget who said it, but it was one of those English folks. So it was either Chesterton, Lewis, or one of them. One of them. One of those. One of those few uh, said something like, "The atheist doesn't. It's not that the atheist won't believe anything. It's that they will believe anything." It's not that, or it's not that they believe in nothing. It's that they'll believe in anything, right? or something like that. Um, because again, it's 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 the whole God-shaped whole thing, first of all. But then also, it's this idea that um, that we have a tendency of making idols of things, particularly if we don't have something that is of utmost significance. If we don't believe in God in a serious enough manner, but even if we do, we're very we're we're far more likely or not maybe far more likely, but we're certainly likely to make idols of things that are closer to us and more more present to our our day-to-day -day lives. So yeah, uh, whether that's the YouTube algorithm or whatever else, yeah, we're, we are, um, we're likely to worship things all the time. And this is, um, what is it? Where is it? Here. Um, William Cavanaugh, who I've uh, mentioned before, other contexts. Oops. It's similar context, but other context nonetheless. Um, here. This book, Migrations of the Holy, uh, God, State, and the Political Meaning of the Church by William Kavanaugh, uh, is an excellent book. And it's on a uh, it's on a topic very closely related to this, about uh, the kind of idolatry that we're prone to committing uh, simply by uh, by coming up with new things to treat as our, uh, as our uh, object of utmost concern, let's say. Uh, in Paul Tillich's sense of, uh, of religion, and so uh, this is uh, this is you know, there is something to this, but again, it's not Nietzsche's primary point. He kind of talks. I think. I mean, I don't know that he talks about this. I wish he had given another nice citation for us here, because uh, I I'm not familiar with Nietzsche really making this point too strongly. He might. He might. That's true. But but that's not the point that he was making in the other passages that we were talking about. Not in the least. Anyway. So while Nietzsche uses the death of God as a critique of religion, it also serves as a critique against the scientism associated with contemporary atheism. Now this scientism, according to Massimo Pigliucci, is defined as a totalizing attitude that regards science as the ultimate standard and arbiter of all interesting questions, or alternatively, that seeks to expand the very definition and scope of science to encompass all aspects of human knowledge and understanding. Uh, Pigliucci is a stoic, by the way. Uh, really, really interesting guy. Um, I, I generally recommend a lot of his writings. Um, but he is also, uh, a, a as a philosopher, who's not one of those self-loathing philosophers who just wishes he could do he could have done better in science um, and wishes he knew math, um, he does take the discipline of philosophy very seriously. And he's a, he's, a, he's a hell of a promoter of the discipline of philosophy and a defender of the discipline of philosophy against attacks like those of the, of, uh, from the sort of scientism direction. So you're here. And following Nietzsche's critique, the scientism often equates to filling the mold left by Christianity with scientific beliefs. So rather than asking us to be anti-God or anti-science, Nietzsche is challenging us to respond to the death of God. Perhaps, you know, by putting a posse together, waiting outside the bar where we know God likes to go get sloshed on Thursdays, and then following him home, and when the moment strikes, we just beat him to death with golf clubs. And I mean, Nietzsche thinks we already did that, and so does Christianity, so... Um, 
All right. Anyway, another one of those jokes that kind of when it took us a field. In other words, we got to complete the act of killing him. Now, what this might look like in practice isn't completely clear, but it's at the heart of Nietzsche's broader philosophical project. Things like master morality dominating slave morality and the idea of the ubermensch both describe individuals strong enough to respond to the death of God, not by replacing God with something else, you know, looking for another set of transcendent values like God or nature, but by creating new values for ourselves. Okay, so he is going into this, and this is what the, the existentialists broadly picked up from Nietzsche uh, into, the 20th, into the 20th century, so uh, Sartre most notably, um, that this is a kind of, again, it's the will to power, it's self-assertion, it's, um, it is rather than replacing, uh, replacing morality that we receive from, from Christianity with morality that we discover uh, scientifically, if the, you know, the Sam Harris approach, if you will, um, that it, that we, we ought to uh, decide freely, right? That we do ought to embrace our, uh, embrace the fact that we are radically set free from God. This is not, um, I don't think this is quite finish. It's, it's weird to call this sort of finishing the death of God, right? Finish killing God or whatever, however he said it, right? It's weird to call it that. Um, it's more like taking seriously the implications of atheism. And I will say the existentialists and even more so the absurdists um, really did take seriously the implications of atheism. And that was very much following on, on Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, in a way that a lot of the sort of new atheists and a lot of the the rationalistic, scientismistic atheists um, really fail to, because they do try to to just replace God with reason, not knowing that reason is another name for God. Now the absurdists do this particularly well, uh, simply because they 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 don't just replace reason with reason; they get rid of reason. And that's kind of the same thing that the existentialists do in a, in a more measured sort of way, because they do reject reason as a basis for ethics, as a basis for understanding the world. They, they, they replace reason with human will, right? And so that is a kind of, uh, I mean, you, I guess you could, you could call it this, but it's a weirdly edgy way of putting it, and uh, only, to, only as a... Uh, I suspect primarily as a way of, uh, of uh, turning the phrase cleverly and sneaking in the beat him to death with golf clubs joke. And this is why Nietzsche is far from an angry 17 year old atheist. And in fact, he's on the side of life and affirmation rather than mm. so long as what you mean by that is what the existentialists mean by that, which is, uh, which is the, the human will untethered from any sort of stable reality, um, having its own way with, uh, with, what it takes reality to be right? or what it decides reality is to be right um that is uh that is not exactly uh, despite the the essay titled the contrary by sartre that, that that species of existentialism is not exactly a humanism uh it is a deracination from the the stable consistency of the world by dismissing the stable consistency of the world and by dismissing our connection to it uh, and by dismissing the constraints placed upon us by God, i.e. by our place within reality, we're free spinning wills with nothing to aim towards. And so we have all of this freedom with nothing to do with it, which is what the absurdists noticed. And so they, they, uh, this is why Camus famous question was uh, the only question worth asking is why not kill myself? And uh, yeah, that's actually a really serious question if you have no uh, sort of foundational basis in reality. So it is really hard. And, and so, I mean, maybe, here we go, uh, maybe we can even criticize Nietzsche of failing to fully reconcile with the, f the, with the implications of atheism, really. Because if we do take this to be a, a sort of empowering notion that we have absolute will to control, uh, to control our relationship to the world, and that there is no no stable reality to which we find ourselves tethered. That the implications of that are are even more severe than Nietzsche laid out to begin. They go much further than that. They go the route of the existentialists. They go the route of the absurdists. They go the route of nihilists. 
And Nietzsche, despite his reputation, I, I, it was hard to call him a nihilist because, as he's about to say, Nietzsche did believe in uh, sort of uh, sort of ethics of greatness, uh, of individual greatness, greatness of the the Superman, the Ubermensch. So, uh, so let's uh, back up a second and let's see. Seventeen-year-old atheist, and in fact, he's on the side of life and affirmation rather than negating human life through saying stuff like either uh, actually heaven is all that really matters, or actually science explains our whole existence. The death of God means doing away with divine shadows and affirming our own humanity in all of its immediacies. Okay, the problem there is what are we affirming? And if there is no stable human nature, which Nietzsche denied, and the existentialists deny, and most, most vaguely serious atheists deny, what are we affirming? We are affirming our own humanity. We're affirming nothing in particular. We're affirming whatever it is that we would like to affirm. There is no, like, there is no humanism to it because there's nothing to, that, that there is to be human. Our existence is all that we are affirming, and even that has no stable character to it. Right? Our existence passes from moment to moment as we, as we, as we, you know, as we uh, sort of come into and pass out of being in a in a sort of Parmenidean sort of in a Parmenidean way, because the atoms of my body are distinctly are are all different than the ones I was born with, and all of those kinds of concerns, right? The ship of Theseus problem of the human person, right? Which is only a problem if there is no stable, solid human nature and therefore no soul, right? Which is the point here. This is what Nietzsche will ultimately wind up concluding, and of course he doesn't reconcile with this problem not seriously enough in the very same way that he's 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 you know accuses the uh, the less serious atheists of, of failing to reconcile with the the significance the the implications of atheism i don't think he does either because it's not a kind of empowering humanist uh, joyful thing it is it's existential dread the existentialist got that right uh, so, yeah. that isn't to say that they they got their they got their syllogism right they did not get their premises right let's put it that way and maybe this is why the new atheists don't feel that new anymore and why when a comedian like Ricky Gervais or maybe it's because they've been doing this for 20 years that could be it does a bit about why God is dead or dumb it's most likely just to engender bored yawns now, oddly enough, yesterday's Richard Dawkins is today's Jordan Peterson, a figure who is precisely rejecting elements of science for a renewal of a very specific reading of traditional Christianity. And whereas the atheism of the new atheists often became an excuse for Islamophobia amongst folks like Bill Maher, the theism of someone like Peterson serves as an excuse for homophobia, transphobia, racism, oh, and also more Islamophobia. Now, surely this trend will wane. And in a few years, there will be another return of a science-focused atheism that continues to ignore the critiques leveled by Nietzsche in the 19th So this is also assuming that the, the sort of Jordan Peterson thing is a theistic moment. And it's not exactly. Yeah, he has, um, he, he, he talks about the significance of, uh, of, you know, historical Christianity and the ideas of Christianity. But it's in the very same way that Nietzsche did, right? It, it, Peterson is not Christian. Now, newly, as of this recording, his wife is becoming Catholic. Praise be to God. But he's not, at least not yet. And so I don't think that he is, uh, he, I don't think that he, he has fundamentally reconciled with, with, uh, with the meaning of god but he is at least taking the ideas very seriously in a way that nietzsche would have us do and then to to explore the consequences of the idea of theism and then therefore the consequences of the ideas of atheism and you also find that you know i to the whole like the you know homophobia transphobia racism point um I don't, I don't, I don't think I have to say anything about it. It's just that uh, it's just clearly baseless and, quite frankly, meaningless insults. Uh, now, now, Islamophobia, if by that we mean 
Um, if by that we mean criticisms of the political element of Islam to the point where we are concerned about Islam as a political religious force in the world, uh, yeah, fair enough. But that actually comes at that that concern comes out of the Enlightenment. That's the very same reason that John Locke, for instance, um, hated the Catholic Church was because of its political elements and that it wasn't this this uh, secular and sectarian religion among many. And so that's, uh, you know, the, the the criticisms that we might have of Islam in that sense are, are very much modernist, uh, atheistic even, uh, or secular, certainly secular uh, in nature, rather than sectarian, let's say, in nature. Um, the, the the Christian critic of Islam criticizes, criticizes theology uh, and invites conversion rather than, you know, doing whatever it is that the Bush administration did. But anyway, I, I mean, yeah, it's... Let's go back a minute. Surely this trend will wane. And in a few years, there will be another return of a science-focused atheism that continues to ignore the critiques leveled by Nietzsche in the 19th century. This does assume a weird sort of pendulum model, which doesn't seem to be the case. Like, yeah, there was this weird new atheism thing that happened in the, the beginning of the century. And yeah, there is a kind of... There is a sort of like pseudo spiritual or more like psychological, but pseudo spiritual revival happening among young people today, 20 years later. But you can't really just follow that pattern back through history, uh, nor can you assume that there is going to be such a pattern moving forward through history. That's kind of silly. Uh, that's a very huge assumption to make for no particular reason. And as such, we see both sides of the coin that Nietzsche was worried about in the wake of the death of God. On one side, we have those unaware of how a lack of engagement with religion leads right into a theologically infused scientism. On the other, those unaware of the death of God who use religious ideas as a way to negate humanity. Now, in both cases, these figures. What about religious? What about religious people who use theological ideas to embrace humanity? The glory of God is man fully alive, right? The idea is that. The idea ought to be that it is our our human reason that is the image and likeness of God. That uh, that to be fully human is to be in the image of God. Is to 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 participate in this this theodrama. What about that? Because that is um, that's the pre Nietzschean religion. That is the pre death of God religion that does exist in today's world, although it is rare. Um, it's. I mean, it exists most fully in in the again in the the liturgical branches of Christianity. Obviously, most so in Catholicism, in serious Catholicism, not necessarily in Christmas and Easter, um, barely pew warmers kind of Catholicism, but in serious Catholicism certainly, certainly in Orthodoxy, in the more high church, in some of the more uh, serious high church branches of Protestantism, who at least stick with something like classical theism. In cases like that, there is this this radical alternative that is not that is that is it's not what Nietzsche is criticizing on either side the the, atheist, the atheistic side or the uh, the fundamentalist side, but it's also not what he's promoting the nihilistic Ubermensch. It's the opposite of what he is promoting. It's on the other side of what he's criticizing. It is going back to a pre-modern view of the world as we ought to, because, I mean, philosophically speaking, a lot of modernity was a horrible wrong turn. I've talked about this endlessly. I mean, see my video on, on Alistair McIntyre's disquieting suggestion if, uh, for a little more on this. But that is a real alternative, and it's not one that's reconciled. And, it's, and quite frankly, this is the key here, and I keep getting back to this point, this is fascinating to me, especially, and it's, it's it's delightfully and deliciously ironic that he does not understand that this that the presenter here, not not Nietzsche, wisecracker, does not understand that this is an alternative because he doesn't fundamentally he does not understand the ideas of Christianity, so as to criticize them. And again, I think this has to do with with this. Uh, this, is, this is speculation, might be uncharitable speculation. So grain of salt. But I think this has to do with this um, rigid evangelical, probably fundamentalist upbringing that did not take religion or theology or faith 
or Christianity or the Logos seriously at all. And so that was, I think, I think it is one of these big blind spots that he has. In fact, it's a blind spot that Nietzsche would point out to him or ought to point out to him. This inability to reconcile or even recognize what it is that Christians mean when we're speaking seriously about God. And once you reconcile that, you can, you can, you can come to the conclusion that God exists and be a Christian. Or you can come to the conclusion, the perhaps absurd conclusion, that God does not exist and either wallow in despair or uh, assert your will to power over being. Or you can fail to sufficiently recognize what it is to believe in God. And you can be the kind of, uh, the kind of fundamentalist uh, that he used to be or the kind of fundy atheists uh, that, that he's criticizing here, but also sort of embodying a little bit. All right, so the, the rest of this is basically outro. So there we go. We're back. Anyway, um, that was, uh, yeah, 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 that was pretty bad. But, but now I've seen worse. Don't, don't, uh, so, so I don't want to say that this was the worst thing I've ever seen. So thank you, though, for, uh, for, for bringing this to my attention. You know who you are. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my, uh, my reaction to it. I, I, I actually really do enjoy doing these. Um, I hope you enjoy watching them, and I hope we, uh, we can actually learn something from these, at least a little bit. Uh, so if you have other videos, whether it's from Wisecrack or from anybody else that you'd like to see me uh, pick apart, analyze, and, re and uh, react to in this way, uh, go ahead and send it my way. Um, if you're not in there, uh, the Discord server, which you'll find linked in the description, is a great place to do that. Uh, so by all means, uh, jump on in there and, and discuss this uh, this video, uh, or go ahead and discuss any of these these sorts of things, and uh, you know, send me some more. Anyway, I had a good time. I hope you had a good time. I hope that we learned at least something here. I hope we had a fruitful discussion. I'll see everybody next time.